Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece. Episodes four. Hold on, hold on. Let me find it. Episodes 430 through 432. A warlord in prison, Jim Bay the Honorable Pirate. Chief Guard Saldeth's Trap. Level 3, Starvation Hell. And the Unleashed Swan, a reunion with Bon Clay. In this episode, Mr. Two is here. I'm so excited, you guys. I'm so excited. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to, I believe it's Florian, this episode for commissioning. I just want to double check. Yes, it is. Thank you, Florian. Um, Florian. Oh, he's here in the chat. Hi. And so is Seraphim. They were here also for my live action One Piece coverage. Um, you guys, these were really, really fun episodes. I should mention that I just skipped over a grouping that were fillers uh so 426 through 429 are all titled a special presentation related to the movie and then like a title and i am really curious related to which movie like i know there are a bunch of one piece movies so if anybody is interested in telling me about that i am all ears i wouldn't be mad about like watching a different one piece movie um because like you know, I have curiosity about how that all works. I, the one One Piece movie that I watched, uh, which I'm trying to remember how, like how the title went, was so weird and spooky in its way and good that I am genuinely like, I know that it's kind of considered the best of the movies, but I would still be interested. But anyway... We are not here for that. So the whole, like, the main thrust of these three episodes <laughs> is how much everybody just wants to break out of the prison and how Luffy doesn't want to do that. And everybody else seems really confused and annoyed by him. Um, and it's really fun because it's like, he makes it pretty clear what it is that he's trying to do and they keep acting surprised by it. And I'm like, y'all really just need to listen. I don't know how many more ways he can say this to you. It feels like all of it has been pretty consistent thus far. Um, so let's start things off with Jimbei, the honorable pirate. I hate how it just unmutes itself every time I start to play it. Oh, you guys drive me nuts. So this episode, we start off where we had left with the last one, which is just Luffy and Mr. Three and the, you know, realization of who this is. And we have like a, a bit of a detour with some guards where they are talking about how worried they all were when they were assigned to this place. And the fact that it has turned out to be an extremely easy job, actually. And uh, this is just giving an illustration of how complacent everybody has grown in this place. That they just aren't, even though it's supposed to be like the tightest security, all of the guards really seem completely unworried about whether somebody is going to break out. It's been such a long time since anybody has managed that, that it almost seems like they have gotten to a point where they don't believe it's even possible. And they are relying, it feels to me, on the structure of the prison itself, rather than thinking they are meant to be part of this. And this continues as a theme so that like, eventually, one of the, the captains or something, I'm not sure what position he holds, is 
in the third of these three episodes, like yelling at the other guys, our security should not be falling apart this easily. And I was like, yeah, y'all, this does seem like it. You take one card out off of the foundation of this thing and the entire structure just collapses. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <laughs> Seraphim, woo, best queer is here. Bonclé is love, Bonclé is life. I believe this would be for Strong World, which is great to watch. It's the first movie to get input directly from Oda. Oh, none of the other movies got input from Oda? Well, you said the first movie, not the only movie. But how many movies came out before? Like, I mean, so my understanding full disclosure here about how I, I know how this works. Like the most I know is that Oda is super overworked and likely they would be more than willing to be like, Hey, give us your input. But he is too busy to have time to stop and like chit chat with them. So it winds up being like, you know, most of the movies are simply made as spinoffs and he doesn't have anything to do. That's my guess. But, um, I am surprised at the idea that more of them didn't just at least like ask for some input. That's pretty bonkers to me. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I can't get sidetracked here. So yeah, these guards are all like discussing amongst themselves how, you know, it's called like hell, but it's only really hell for the prisoners. And, at one point, a guy says, speaking of dangerous men, that other guy who's a warlord, the one who rebelled against Navy headquarters, he's got me on edge, too. And this is when we go over to the cell where I don't know if this guy is sharing a cell with Ace or if he is just right next to Ace. Um, this guy is saying, strike me. I have no regrets. And one of these fucking uh, minotaur types bashes him in the head with a mace. And he says like violent oaf. And I'm like, you just asked him to hate you, sir. I'm not sure what you thought he was going to do. Um, they are sharing a cell. Okay. I'm seeing it right here. Um, so this guy, Jimbei, he says... My heart craves justice. My heart wants war. And we get the subtitle here. Warlord of the Sea, Jimbei the Honorable Pirate, a whale shark fisherman, formerly... Sorry, I'm trying to... Because like when I pause it, it gets dark at the bottom of the screen. And so it's not letting me read the rest of this like subtitle here. I have to, uh, a whale shark fisherman formerly with a bounty of 250 million berries. Dope. And he is saying, I can't die here. Not like this. To hell with my title as warlord. I don't even want it anymore. If it means that I could stop this fight, I would. I would happily lay down my own life. And Ace doesn't have much of a reaction to this it's just him listening um so then we go back to the security guys who are like wait what the fuck where are the prisoners and i really love that eventually it's they're notified like oh yeah we found them and they're sort of going oh good and then uh but there's two of or there's three of them now and they're like fuck what is going on um i love this this guy's called shaggy security guard and then there's mustache security guard I mean, how else are you going to keep track of them? That seems totally reasonable to me. We also get another moment of the um, the overall map of the like tower with all its levels and how we, we just see exactly where Luffy and company are on the map. And you guys know I really appreciate it anytime they do this. I don't really need it because this place is very simple, the setup of it. So it's pretty easy for me to remember overall. But I did really really need this for ns lobby and i always appreciated when they did it especially because we had multiple people we were trying to keep track of that were in different places on ns lobby as well because our whole crew was there it's much easier this time because it's just luffy and these two guys who are pretty much always going to be with him 
And you all have to have heard me say how much I adore any storyline where enemies need to team up and be on the same side, however briefly. Big, big fan of that. I love it. So I was already really excited about Buggy being here. Mr. Three being thrown into the mix was an extra fun bit because it's one thing to watch Buggy sort of like stew by himself thinking through how he's going to screw Luffy over. It's a lot more fun, in my opinion, to watch him think this over with the in the company of Mr. Three. And I have no doubt, you know, that the two of them are going to scheme together. And then eventually one of them is going to have to screw the other over. Like, that's the way that all of this would have to go. And I am fine with that. I just... It, it, this is always fun for me. Um, so all of this, I have no idea. Like, I didn't look through the titles of the episodes ahead of time. So when Mr. Two shows up, I was so, so excited. I was really, really happy. Um, sorry. Uh, Seraphim says, Honorable Pirate is a new way of trying to translate his epitaph. The for The normal one is first son of the sea. His actual epitaph is really hard to get right in English because it's a lot of wordplay involving the Japanese words for channel as in the waterway, chivalry, and a term of respect for high ranking Yakuza. In, or Yakuza. Which way is the right way to say that? Um, okay, so first son of the sea. I like that better. Like honorable pirate just feels sort of whatever we know a lot of those it's not that exciting but first son of the sea feels like he's got a connection to the sea which makes sense because he's a whale shark which are humongous by the way i was i when i was in honduras uh i went scuba diving and there was the choice to scuba dive among whale sharks in this particular area and I remember being on the boat and I could see them down there and I just went, oh, count me out. No, thank you. I had no interest. It just felt to me like, they're, they're, I don't like being in the water with something that huge. You just feel like you're at a distinct disadvantage. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you're just not in your own territory anymore. Anyway, whale sharks, super intimidating to me. So I love this moment. They, the way that Buggy throws the uh, manticores and I can't remember the name of the other scorpions, I guess, off the scent is by using his feet, which are separated from his body down a hallway making really like obvious footstep noises so that these animals go running in that direction but unfortunately they realize that they've been bamboozled pretty quick and also buggy's super loud about how he tricked them so it doesn't last at all like they it, it distracts them for a second and i was kind of like oh that's a pretty clever idea and then he has to immediately go and ruin it which is pretty much on brand so i don't know why i'm surprised um i also really want to talk about these manticores and later on the other creature that they run into which i don't remember what they call it but you guys it's really giving like hunger games in here um, for those who are not familiar with the Hunger Games, uh, a big part of the story is the way in which the ruling class at the Capitol fuck around with science and specifically with like genetic engineering and modification, both in terms of like body mods on people, but also, uh, modifying animals and a lot of the creations they come up with were used in war. Like there is a bird called the Jabberjay that is meant to be a, um, uh, it can remember and repeat exactly paragraphs of human speech. And they're 
spies and they basically just like sort of record from the trees and then fly back and repeat what was overheard. But another thing that they come up with that I have found so freaky and I'm really interested to see Rashawn's reaction to because I'm covering the Hunger Games with her are the mutations. And the Jabberjay is like a mutation, but these mutations in the actual games are often made with uh, human aspects and are like the, the human aspects are taken from other contestants. So what I mean is after most of the other candidates of the Hunger Games have been killed off, there is a group of wild dogs or something that comes after Katniss and a couple other people that are left. And they have the eyes of all of the contestants that have been killed, like human eyes. And it freaks her out so bad. And I remember personally, like the, the fur on the animals is also like the exact shade of the hair of the person whose eyes they, the animal has as well. And there was something about that that was so incredibly sickening to me. Like I just, there were a lot of things about the Hunger Games that were very disturbing. This, I always have a very strong reaction to anything like medical torture or like mad scientist experiments on people. That sort of thing really, really gets to me. And the knowledge that evidently in the one piece universe, we've got something like that going on because these creatures have human faces and not only that, but they repeat phrases that people have repeated often in the prison, which really varies in terms of how intimidating that part is. Because at one point they're yelling like, oh, the pain is too much. It hurts, which is really awful. But then there is uh, one of them that's just yelling like strawberry panties, which I don't know what to what to make of that. Um, but yeah, so it's weird because like it's treated as a joke, you know, like this, this, these things being made of people basically. And I found it so incredibly horrifying and I was truly taken aback by how much it's just sort of, Oh, isn't it like silly? Isn't this goofy? It starts off like they're leaning into the horror of it, but then it feels like they sort of back off because it's quite, horrible like i think maybe they thought okay maybe we've taken this like as far as we should because it's enough to give somebody nightmares if they think about it too much um but whatever the case i just really like i don't like the implications of this i'm assuming that this is supposed to be like these experiments are done in the prison and that these used to be prisoners but it's just so, it's so upsetting. It's so disturbing. So anyway, we have, um, uh, a lot more running down the hallways and apparently Mr. Three had not realized until this point that they're meant to be heading further in so that Luffy can find his brother. He has no idea that Fire Fist Ace is Luffy's brother. So, as he's discovering this, he's like, I am going to get the fuck out of here. I absolutely do not want any of this smoke. I want to get out of here. And he starts running up the stairs. But then when Luffy's like, you said you would help. He says, well, if the stairs are connected from level one to level three, I could use straw hat as bait for the beast guarding the stairs and make my escape. So he abruptly is like, Okay, I'll go with you. And it's really funny because he's telling himself, like, it's ingenious. And I love, there's a sense to me that, like, Buggy knows that he's fucking going to be doing his own thing right away. But anyway, they run off. And this is when he goes, like, face first into this huge creature 
that is laying here asleep. And it's like another one of those cases of a giant inadvertently adorable animal that I do not want to be the enemy here. He is known as the Sphinx. You guys, I absolutely cannot handle the sad Sphinx and him being a bad guy in all of this. I can't do it. I don't like how incredibly depressing his whole vibe is. He's got this really, really sad expression. He speaks really, really slowly. And there's a, a, a sense of he doesn't want to be here doing any of this either. Like, I just felt so bad bad for this little creature and they're all looking like horrified and backing away like they're so scared of him but to me he he did not come across as scary he really looked to me like hellboy i think because of like the sad eyes and the lumps on his forehead that are sort of like where hellboy's horns had been it's like the same positioning so the the whole thing with this little dude I say little, he's huge. It just, I don't want any of this fighting to be happening. I don't like this at all. And he, I was hoping at one point when Luffy seems to be like getting along with him, I was thinking that he might wind up becoming one of their friends instead of being an enemy. And by the end of the third of these episodes, I don't think that's going to happen. And I was so disappointed because it really seems like him and Luffy are connecting. And the reason they're connecting is great because for whatever reason, this creature just won't stop talking about noodles. And I don't know what it is that he has heard about noodles in this prison. But evidently, he has heard a great variety because he's over here talking about pork noodle and soup noodle and cold noodle and sesame noodle and all the noodles. He And he says them each like a battle cry, kind of. I say battle cry simply because he does fight after he says it. But I in no way mean to imply that he is shouting it in an intimidating way because it's really not a shout that's intimidating he says it just sort of like pork noodle like ugh, what are you in my face for like that's the most aggressive he ever really gets i don't know i uh i really just the whole deal with this creature makes me sad and i'm just gonna sort of speed through things there, There is a moment where Luffy's like, oh, you're making me hungry. And Mr. Three starts making little wax versions of himself. And it, he, Luffy is like sitting on the Sphinx's back while it's like trying to figure out which of these uh, figures is the actual Mr. Three. And Luffy is just egging him on and being just like, yeah, get him, get him. Like he's treating it like it's a game for both of them, which, um, honestly, I'm pretty much fine with because like Luffy's easily entertained is is the probably most polite way that I'm going to find to say that. So yeah, I don't have a problem with the concept of them becoming buds. I just don't think it looks like that's going to happen. And I am hoping I'm wrong. I'm still holding out a little bit of hope. I'll be honest with you guys. So um, let me jump ahead past that point. Oh my God, that's right. He and uh, <laughs> and Buggy, they decide that they're going to like work together to screw Luffy over and use him as bait in order to get out of here. And I love when, when they finally sort of break out and they begin to flee. Buggy says, all according to plan. And Mr. Three says that this wasn't the plan. We're just running for our lives. And there was something about that that got me in the giggles. I was really laughing about that. 
Um, meanwhile, the guards are trying to figure out what the fuck is going on. They can feel their like office is shaking. Shit's really going down, but they don't understand what's happening because there aren't cameras in a lot of places or the cameras have been fucked up because this creature is quite humongous. So, you know, and eventually the ground like breaks underneath them and they go plummeting further downward. And I love at I think it's Buggy who is yelling at Luffy, damn it, you are just a huge pain in the ass. And I really felt that. I feel like that would be my overall assessment of Luffy as much as I might like him. I would be like, dude, why are you such a fucking pain? Everything I have to deal with with you is such... It's always something goes wrong. Like... (laughs) Um, so this is when we go back to Jinbei and he says, uh, it's what I have to deal with as a warlord, as a pirate who hates other pirates. Um, and Ace is like, you hate other pirates? And he's like, yeah, I know I used to visit Whitebeard's ship on a regular basis, but because of my status with the government, I'd travel underwater to get there. Even so, he and his crew were good friends to me. And Ace says, well, you did try to kill me one time. And Jinbei says, yeah, I could say the same thing about you. But if we just set all of that aside, I owe Whitebeard a debt. Fishman Island is now a peaceful haven once again, thanks to that old man of yours. And we find out pirates sailing along the Grand Line must pass through Fishman Island to reach the New World. So not long after the dawn of the Great Pirate Era, the island was in trouble. Numerous human pirate and navy ships that were chasing after Whitebeard arrived there wreaking havoc. Countless fishmen and mermaids were kidnapped and sold as slaves. And just when despair threatened to conquer our hearts, Whitebeard showed himself. And basically what he did was he laid claim to Fishman Island as his territory and was like, you fuck with any of these people, you are fucking with me. And all of the folks who have been hassling Fishman Island backed the fuck off because he was that much of a threat. And Jinbei is like, yeah, and he, we aren't the only ones he did that with. There are other islands that he has done something similar and I, the government's targeting him because all they see of him is that he's a pirate. But that's not true, strictly speaking. And I keep trying to tell them that and they don't want to fucking listen. And uh, we then get a flashback of Ace where he's listening to a speech about like who would reign. Let's see. I'm trying to see this moment here because it starts off with a. Uh, uh, Whitebeard reaching his hand out. If he happened to die, what would become of the sea? Who would dare to... Uh... Oh, no, I'm sorry. Ace, this isn't Whitebeard speaking. This flashback is happening without dialogue. And what Jimbei is saying is is voiceover over the scene. Um, so, yeah, he's saying who would reign in his absence... Uh, Who but a fool would dare to usher in such madness? I want to stop the war, even though I must give up my life. I want to res. I wanted to rescue you, Ace, but I failed. So that's why he busted in here. And I am really, really uh, excited for when we eventually reach Ace and are able to get both of them free. What kind of uh, shit we're going to get up to. And Jimbei says, even now, I'm thinking that maybe there's going to be a miracle and somebody is going to come and save us. And you guys, I really would love to, just for a moment, if you were in this sort of situation where you were like going to be executed, would you not also fully be expecting like a last minute rescue? I feel like it's in the, it's in our nature for a lot of us to just think these things just don't happen to us. It's that's not how the how things go. And I would fully be 
thinking like there's i'll find a way out of this somehow you know um i'm sure once you live the kinds of lives these guys do it's not necessarily the kind of mindset you're going to be in but uh then we get uh somebody from the shadows speaking up this is a now or never opportunity to defeat whitebeard even locked down here i can't help but feel a bit excited and it's crocodile and he's out here stroking his hook hand and he says it's not just me and all of a sudden all of these dudes from all over the prison start talking about how they want a piece of white beard and it's so weird you guys because the way this is animated all of the dudes surrounding them that are saying like oh yeah give me a piece of him none of them have like distinct features all you see is a flat color coloring for their face and a uh like you know the their eyes are there's no pupils to them it's just like a white space and you can see their teeth and that's it all of them have really in specific features that I found kind of puzzling the styling for this. I don't know if it's just meant to be like, you don't need to know who all it is or if they're meant to be sort of anonymous and it's just like, they're kind of nobodies, but everybody who is chiming in 100% is down to fuck Whitebeard up. And I can't even tell if any of them have like a real particular personal grievance. I think it's just, it's almost like I want to just be the one like for the sake of it. Uh, and I find it really weird considering that if Whitebeard were to get here and fuck shit up adequately, he would, I am assuming, let all of these guys free. So I'm not totally sure why they are all so eager to see this guy be taken down because it feels like it's very much against their own best interest. And I'm just sort of like, okay, dudes, I feel like you're not thinking this through fully, but okay. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that's the way the episode ends is like all of them being like, yeah, 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 let us fuck him up. And uh, Jimbe is saying silence. And then, let's see, silver medalists who could never defeat Roger and Whitebeard all holding back their tears. Um, this is when Crocodile starts laughing. And I am excited about Crocodile being around. Just can't wait for that. He was like a really fun villain. It... You know, they got the better of him in the end, but it was, it, it felt like a close thing. I'm into it. So, we then go to the, uh, the moment where all of the guards get, um, they start to figure out what it is that Luffy is doing. He is, they didn't know either that he is related to Ace. So, now that they're figuring it out, and our understanding that he's going to be heading further and further in, they're like, oh, wait, he's trying to stop this public execution. This is going to be a whole different thing. They're thinking he's just maybe here to, you know, fuck shit up and get people out. And also they notice that like he must have busted him because we were so distracted with Whitebeard, but they don't know still how he got smuggled inside. So they're still trying to figure that out. Meanwhile, uh, Boa is t like, she finally gets brought down to see Ace. And the whole way this winds up shaking out is that when she gets down there, Magellan, I think is his name. Um, Magellan is like not taken seriously by a lot of the other prisoners. They keep calling him diarrhea guy. And, uh, they prisoners see Boa and completely lose their minds. 
And it's such a weird sequence, y'all, because like the way that they talk to her is a lot more explicit than I was expecting. This show, I feel like in the past hundred or so episodes has been way more direct every time than I'm expecting it to be. So they they just keep on just fucking the thing that I'm thinking is going to be subtext turns out to just be text and I keep being like, oh, okay, I guess we're we're just telling the thing. Um, but yeah, these dudes are just yelling like, hey, come and get some loving or let me show her my snake, things like this. And I keep being really caught off guard by it. But because they're not taking Magellan seriously at all, they he winds up deciding that he's going to lay down the law and he flexes on them by using his poison power on a bunch of them. And uh, while he is totally distracted by this is when Boa delivers the message to Ace about how Luffy is here. He's coming to get you. He knew it was a good chance that you were going to be pissed at him for this, but he had to do what he had to do. And because she like, you know, manages to deliver this whole message while Magellan is otherwise very dramatically engaged, nobody overhears it. And it's a pretty solid plan actually you know like i felt like that worked out quite well and th it's effectively done because we don't hear her deliver the message we are also as viewers distracted by magellan like standing up and making this whole scene and then all of a sudden it cuts to her being like thank you uh for listening that was the that was the whole message i'm done now i can we can go and magellan is like a little startled and going wait already that's it it's all you had to do and she's like yep that's it so that's uh that's what's going up down there and then when we are with let's see i'm trying to see the spot we're at here with uh luffy and the others right 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 we get a little flashback to him punching that fucking celestial dragon which kids i will never get tired of that I will not ever get tired of seeing him punch that guy. It makes me so happy. And we get that flashback because we have Garp and Sengoku talking and Garp is fucking delighted by the fact that Luffy has busted into Impel Down. He is so, it is so funny. I can't help but laugh because he is cackling like that is the word to use literally in this guy's face and he's also eating because he's he also has the thing that luffy has where he has to be constantly eating so he's laughing with his mouthful of food which is somehow even more just disrespectful and guys i just i thought this was so funny he is not even trying to conceal his delight and Sengoku is so irritated. He's getting so pissed that eventually he comes over. And I don't know what it is exactly that Garp's eating, but he's eating it out of a bag. It sort of looks like it might be donuts. It also might just be like uh, like rice balls. It might be those rice balls that have like the seaweed wrapped around the outside. It's hard for me to tell. But um, Sengoku comes over and grabs the bag out from Garp's hands and Garp gets more mad over that than he has gotten about anything and hard relate. I also get it completely agree, sir. That's the thing to get mad about here. Um, and Sengoku is like, Kuma said that he took care of them at the archipelago and I should have known better than to trust him. And he calls him a fool. And I was like, Ooh, you think he's a fool, but, uh, that implies like that he is not competent. And what I think is happening is that he's, uh, you know, in on all of this with them, which I am glad that hasn't occurred to this guy because as soon as he gets, you know, as soon as it's discovered that he might be in on this, then the game is up and I need him to be playing in the game for a little bit longer we still need him with this so i hope that kuma doesn't get found out for a little bit being thought to be incompetent is better than being thought to be a traitor i think 
I'm sure there would be people out there who would disagree with that, but that's, that's how I feel about it for the moment. Um, so yeah, this little, this bit with Garb, this just cracked me up. I just thought it was so funny. Him, he's laughing. So you guys, there's tears like pouring out of his eyes. Sengoku says, laugh it up while you can, but this is going to have a serious repercussion on our, uh, reputation. There's only so much we can do. And this is when he grabs the food away and Garp says, no fair. And Sengoku says, shut up already. And he just opens the bag and tips his head back and pours literally all of it down his throat. Um, so this is when our guys all wake up on, where are they? Level three or level four? Are they level three? It's the hot level. And the ground, it turns out, feels like a frying pan. At one point, a bird falls out of the sky and it's like completely roasted and ready to eat, essentially. And that kind of heat, which of course, like, this would really actually kill them, but it's fine. I don't care. Um, and, you know, the whole deal with this place is that it's meant to, like, break you. And so it's not only this incredible intense heat, but it's also that the guys are being starved. They're not being given water either. So just, you know, being weakened as much as possible. Um, meanwhile, Mr. Three is like, yo, my whole deal is like using wax as a weapon. And if I am in a place where my shit melts immediately, this is not awesome for me. I don't like it. Uh, so this place looks like, it reminds me of the, the places that Crocodile completely leveled. It's looks like lots of sand, well, we wind up finding out, you guys, and this is pretty fucking, this is pretty morbid for this show. Um, what we find out is that the sand on the ground is likely the remains of the prisoners that got like, it's like their ash, essentially. Wow. That is dark. <laughs> that really I was not I was not ready for that one, I gotta say. I'm I, I like it as a device, but I I genuinely was kind of startled that they were like, Oh uh, yeah, this is probably, you know, just like human ash flying around that you're walking all over. I was like, Wow. Um but we don't find that out until later. So they get moving. It's really awful. Like they're having such a hard time and, uh, eventually come across the dudes who are being kept prisoner and they are skin and bone mouths hanging open, just desperate for something to drink. And buggy is like, you wouldn't know it to look at them, but all of the dudes on this floor were real badasses at one point. Like, they got put here because of how terrible they are. At least 50 million berries ahead. And they're kept here a shell of their former selves. Um, okay, this is level four, according to the little map that we see here. Thanks, map. Always appreciate you. Um, and he says, now you know why this floor is covered with what appears to be sand. And I was just like, yikes, dude. Uh, so... Or no, this is level three. Luffy says, okay, so let's go to level four. I thought it just said that we were on level four. I must have, must have been wrong. Um, so one of the soldiers or the guardsmen here sees them and you hear this guy uh, say, be patient. All is go go going according to plan. Now, I don't know if I am imagining this. So forgive me if this is completely incorrect, but the voice of Sal Death sounds so much like, uh, what is his name? Warwick William. What is his name? The, the guy from Willow, the little person. I can't remember. Warwick Davies, right? That's it. I think, um, 
it sounds so much like him. And I haven't checked to see because obviously spoilers can I can stumble on those at any point. But I really had a moment of like, wait a second. And it would be kind of fun to have somebody who is sort of famous show up as a uh, a voice on this show. I would enjoy that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. But I just wanted to say in case it, it was actually what it sounded like. Um, so, yeah, these dudes are uh, the – it seems like the ones that are working with Saladith are like – a different group, like a faction of the guards. Like they're not, everybody in this prison isn't working together the same way. And I don't know what to make of this, but, um, they have a, a net in place that they use to scoop all three of them up, including the Sphinx, by the way. And it's an interesting thing. Once they like yell about how, if they had gone a different way, they wouldn't have gotten trapped. Saldeth is like, oh, no, no, no. We've been watching you the whole time. And we had like a variety of traps. So if you went somewhere else, you'd still have gotten caught. It would have just been a different trap that time, which really that sucks. Um, and I love how because the Sphinx is in there with them, they're all being squashed up against the like the. What do you call it? The edges of the net, which um, I believe Luffy figures out that they're made out of sea stone so he can't use his powers when he's in the net, which is diabolical. Um, and this little guy, Saldeth, he tries to tell his name. At first, Luffy says salt breath. And then he's like saltine head or sardine head. That's what it is. You know how he does. Um, I don't know what to make of Saldeth. He is... He looks like a like little mushroom. Uh, he's very, very small, which actually maybe it is Warwick Davies because this is like a, a little character and maybe they went and got a little person to voice a little character. I have no idea if that's like makes any sense, but, or maybe somebody's imitating him on purpose because of that. Like, I don't know. Um, but yeah, he's got this tiny little white three-piece suit and the vest underneath is not white it's yellow but goes with the overall suit the suit has like tails that are a little bit too long they seem to almost drag on the ground so like neck down it's not an appropriate outfit to be like a prison guard but it's a pretty normal looking outfit overall it's from the neck up that it's real weird he has what almost looks like an oversized kangle. Like if you took a kangle and just stretched the brim out way, way further. And there are two horns coming out of it because I am assuming he is a demon with a skull, uh, a black skull with like white eye sockets or sorry, a black skull with yellow eye sockets and a yellow nose hole in the middle between the horns. And Saldeth himself has a very ordinary looking face, but he has heavily lidded eyes that have like purple eyeshadow. It's, I don't think supposed to be makeup. I think it's just meant to be like, you know, shadowed eyes, but, uh, he's, it's, he's got a pretty dope design actually. Like in my opinion, sometimes less is more. And so making him be, overall kind of ordinary looking with just the occasional really weird touch here and there i felt like worked pretty well uh and i i feel like he's one of my favorite character designs that i have seen in quite some time just because of how everything at least is a cohesive look instead of the way it can sometimes be where it seems like pieces of the costume are completely random and unrelated to one another and he says something about um i'm trying to find the spot here you're fortunate i was the one who captured you there are four other guards prowling on the floors beyond this one and they're demons and we get a uh what well, looks like a bull i think a rhinoceros a koala and a horse which i am sort of feeling like maybe they're 
this is supposed to be an imitation of like the four horsemen or something, but I may just be completely at like assigning meaning where there isn't any, you know what I'm saying? Which I have been wont to do in the past. I will confess. Um, so yeah, he, the, the, like, it looks like they're good and properly caught up in this net here. And we have Mr. Three and Buggy both entirely giving up, basically being like, oh, that's it then. We're going back to prison. We were so close. Like, this was almost uh, going to be a wrap. But apparently... Everything is going to go wrong now because when they got the Sphinx up in the air in this net, he was asleep. Well, not anymore. He is awake and he is pissed. And he just starts to like roll back and forth inside this net. And he is just so huge. He's starting to talk about noodles again. And, and the guys say something about how he's gone on. He's moved on to pasta now. Oh, that's right. Because he says fettuccine. So it's not just noodles anymore. Although I think he does drop a noodle, uh, a noodle name again a little bit later on. Oh, yeah. Here it is. He yells deep fried noodles. Um, so, yeah, he breaks the whole net apart. All our guys go tumbling to the ground. I love that like Buggy and Mr. Three are going, this fucking sucks. While Luffy's like, hooray, I'm free. It's only positive things for Luffy. And then we get into another fight. He goes up against the Bulgori and is just fucking gum gum gatling in their asses to the ground. It's like really kind of shocking how little fight they put up. He had said that they were tough earlier. He took down three, but he was panting. And here he's taken down like 30 of them. And it's like no problem. Um, and when he's looking around for where buggy and Mr. Three are, he wants to know because he's like worried they're hurt. And when he looks up and he sees them, they're climbing up onto the bridge. He says, oh, they got up there. Good thinking. Buggy turns around and laughing yells, so long, straw hat. Tell your brother I said hello. If he's still alive, I'll buy him a drink. And Mr. Three, and by the way, thanks for being our live bait, you little imbecile. And Luffy's response is, woof, glad to see they're safe. Well, okay. See ya. Thanks a lot for your help, you guys. And the both of them get like briefly caught up in their consciences and are like, oh, my God, he's so sweet. My heart's breaking. And I was like, this is such a weird bit that they keep doing where the bad guys are sort of overwhelmed with I don't know if I want to say remorse, but it kind of feels like remorse. And it's like, oh, really? We've seen Buggy do this, but this is the first time I've seen anything like this from Mr. Three, who I have been sort of assuming is not even like capable. Buggy, I have long held that there's a hint for me that Buggy isn't as bad as he seems. Like he is, but also he isn't. And I accept that from him, but I don't really buy it from Mr. Three. I'll just say that. I'm not sure if that's like, fair or not but i just feel like mr three is way more of a scumbag than buggy buggy just strikes me as somebody who's actually lonely and sad and mr three strikes me as somebody who likes being alone because he has like a real superiority complex and is just like a bad dude you know so again maybe i'm just assigning things and that's not fair but that's the kind of impression that I got off of him. Um, but yeah, so Sal Death is just starts yelling like, don't let him get away. He's got a 300 million berry bounty on him. Um, berry, berry bounty on him. Oof. <laughs> um, and I love Luffy looking around at these guards and saying, I don't have time for all you guys right now. And he is about to get into it when he looks up and here's the Sphinx just yelling Soba another noodle as he 
bashes all of these guys into the ground and he manages to get away in the midst of all this and Sal Death is just standing there like fuck like there's just a really strong I I had him god damn it and it's not even like he's like frustrated like violently frustrated he's just like staring after him like I can't believe I fucked that up you know that kind of like where what's done is done to such a degree that you can't even really be mad because it feels so pointless. That's the vibe I'm getting off of him. Um, so anyway, uh, that's pretty much it. Cause I talked about the third of these episodes. The thing that happens at the end of this is there is a weird noise happening and we have this like quaking in his boots, Mr. Three, who knows who this is. Buggy does not. And y'all, this is so, it's so amazing. So, <laughs> it's so, I, I was so, because like once I realized, it took me a second to figure out what the sound was because he's, I think he's supposed to be like counting in French, but he's not actually, it's not really French. It's supposed to be, I think, in uh, imitation of the kinds of calls that you make when you're doing like ballet exercises. Um, so it took me a moment to like even realize in that scene who this was supposed to be. And then all of a sudden I was like, no way. Oh my God, he's here. And I got so, so excited about it. And once we actually see him, it's so much fun because there's a whole fucking like, uh, uh, what do you call it? Song that gets recited where he says like, when you're queer, you have no fear. And that's like one of the lines. I'm trying to find the exact spot where he he's singing because I can't remember it, but it is really like uh i think a really fun bit where it's easy because of the nature of like the sort of bad faith situation we've got going on with this character where you could take it in such a way that you're like oh this is really gross but i am willfully reading it as wholesome uh like purposely making an effort to do that even though i know that's not what's actually meant necessarily here um so yeah i love and and buggy doesn't know who this is so he's running toward the noise while mr three is trying to stop him and being like wait 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 you don't understand um oh yeah here here it is uh if you think it's see me in here now just wait you'll really hate when i'm angry and he's doing all these little pirouettes but his hands are still like manacled together and i love when he sees mr three and is like oh how are you and mr three says well this is awkward and i was like is it why i don't feel like it is i don't know if it's just supposed to be like it's awkward that he knows me um but yeah, the the moment that I didn't like in this scene, of course, was Buggy just staring at him and saying, what is this creature meant to be? And Mr. Three saying it's best not to question it or something like that. Uh, yeah. What the hell is this strange creature? Here it is. Hard to say. Let's be sure not to let it out. And I was like, oh, that's really, really gross. I hate that. However, eventually they do let him out, even though they say they won't. And when Luffy winds up in a tight spot, he looks up and he thinks it's Zoro. I also, for a moment, was sort of like, wait, Zoro's here? I totally forgot what Mr. Two's powers were supposed to be. And I was so pleased at how elated Luffy is to find out that it's Bunkley. He's so excited. And like, it just, he says at one point, 
I I would still have preferred Zoro, but I'm really glad to see you. And but Clay doesn't take that as an insult at all. He really does seem to be like, no, I get that. And that's, you know, that's fine. That's how it's going to go sometimes. And uh, I really was hopeful that was how Luffy would react because it seemed to me like he left them on good terms. He He did them a good turn and... I was hoping that because Luffy just seems to have goodwill towards people, even when they don't deserve it, that he would keep it for Mr. Two. And he has. And they're actually like buds. And I was, I can't wait to see more of what goes on with this dude. Um, But briefly, I have to take a detour here. Because this new character shows up, this woman. Oh, my God. The, The Marines are out here like, you know... Uh, arguing amongst each other when this door opens and you hear a woman say, hold on a moment. And she steps out. Her name is Di... No, is what's her name? I'm trying to find it because there's a, a little title card that comes up. Uh, I'm Mistress Sadie, our torture expert. It says, Commander of the Demon Guards of Impel Down. Let's talk about Mistress Sadie's outfit here. This is a lot hot pink. I'm totally into that. Y'all know. She has these like pointy toed high heels. And when I say pointy, I mean like it's there. The the toes curl upward. She has got what are sort of like chaps, but they're attached to like a body harness. So her hips are exposed and her midriff and her, the bottom of her boobs are exposed. Like the bottom like she's got like under cleavage and the sleeves of this sort of jumpsuit thing are cut to look like flames and there is like a fringe hanging down over the boobs plus she's got a popped collar that points outward in the same exact direction and with the same color as i think her horns this look is everything you guys i am obsessed with this fucking idiotic character she is clearly like the whole bit is meant to be that she's a dominatrix and she demands that they call her mistress you know i do not care i love all of this this is so great i really really want to see a cosplay of this because i feel like this would be a tough one anytime that you have got under boob that's tricky And I know that there's a lot of women who have figured out a way around it where you make fake boobs out of cloth, basically, which look really real uh, in photos. So I could see you getting away with it by doing that. Um, Or you just sort of like have it come up, but you don't worry too much about trying to get the under cleavage thing to look right. Because like, it's really not gonna look right unless you've got giant titties. So and she also has these earrings, y'all, that look like lit torches or candle they're candles i think yeah um and she has blonde hair with this huge thick fringe of bangs that cover her eyes so you don't really see her eyes at all and just all of this it's great some guy is like starts to get an attitude with her about being demanding to be called mistress and she literally whips him And when he cries out in pain, she goes, oh, those screams are irresistible. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is too much. Like, she's getting horny off of his pain because she's a sadist, which is why she's Mistress Sadie. This is just so, so much. It's so much. Um, So, yeah, she says you can serve the guard outside. Uh, the only, the drawbridge is the only entrance. We'll secure ourselves inside, raise it and seal off impel down completely. We'll do our job. And as long as you do yours, nobody, every time she talks, she just like moans mid sentence. It's so absurd. You guys, I want to hate this so bad and I can't because it's just so funny. Meanwhile, behind her is the creepiest koala, who I guess is one of the demons. The look of him is horrible. He's like this sickening yellow, and he looks almost like he's got human flesh and his midriff. Like, I don't know what's going on there. I really do not care for him. And he has very flat black eyes. There's no, like, whites to his eyes. 
it, it, I don't like anything about him. There's something almost like minstrel like about his design. I don't not not a fan of any of this. Um, but okay, so I'm just like making sure because I kind of did cover some things out of order, but. I have pretty much covered everything, I think, because, yeah, Mr. Two shows up, like, kind of right at the end there and takes care of these guards. He is killing it. You stay away from my friend or things are about to get very ugly. And I should mention, too, how different Mr. Two looks because he's not in his, like, wild outfit that he normally wears with the whole swan motif. He's just in, like, a jumpsuit. He's still got the makeup on, but his look is so much more subdued than usual which i actually think suits him quite well i do miss the swan thing because it's just like so fucking out there but uh i enjoy seeing him in this like black and white get up as well because there's something about it that still feels like on brand and yeah the the reunion between him and luffy with both of them streaming tears is just delightful so Anyway, all right, I have to wrap up. I'm so far over time. The, it was three episodes this time, and they were kind of packed episodes, so I was surprised that I was asked to watch three. But, you know, that's fine. Um, sorry, uh, Seraphim in the chat. Uh, there's a common fan theory that Whitebeard is the one who took Croc's hand. Ooh, I like that. Another translation thing, what she demands to be called in Japanese is Seidi-chan, with Chan being an honorific that is usually only used for really close personal friends. Oh, but yeah, Sadie is so over the top. It's fun. I love this outfit too. It really almost is like on par with what Beyonce wore during the cozy sequence of her live show. It, she didn't wear the same co like outfits to everything. And there wasn't the same costumes, but for some of them, she had this like hot pink ensemble with thigh highs for some of them like you know the leotards for others and it just this is way more complex but it was sort of reminding me of that um all right i've got to go thank you guys so much for hanging out appreciate you all again and hope you're enjoying the coverage until next time toodaloo motherfuckers <laughs>